There we go. All right, so welcome to the Best Teaching Practices Expo panel. Today we are going to hear from our distinguished presenters and hopefully have a great conversation about some awesome teaching practices at UNLV. So um, what we're going to do for the format here is we're going to uh, hear from the provost and then uh, the vice provost, Janet Dufek, is going to present certificates to our distinguished presenters. And then we'll jump right in. And uh, we will take questions between each presenter. So uh, you can put your questions in the comment box. You can raise a hand on Zoom, or you can raise a hand here in the room, and we'll have a conversation. But the presenters are happy to take your questions in between presentations. Um, folks who are online, please do mute yourselves. I think you're all good. Thank you. Awesome. And um, I just want to make a few acknowledgments really quickly. The UNLV Libraries was a great support for this program. They hosted all of the posters, which are available to you on digital scholarship at UNLV. So many thanks, especially to Andrea Wirth and Wynne Frederick, who um, did all the metadata and made this all searchable so that anyone anywhere can find these posters. Um, I also want to thank the Selection Committee of Faculty Center Fellows who reviewed all the posters that were submitted and um, also selected our distinguished posters today. And I would also like to thank the Faculty Center staff, Doris Blackwell, Mackenzie Clark, and Haley Flum, who made this all happen. So here is the agenda. Very excited today to hear from Dr. Amanda Pazinski, then Dr. Katie Rafferty, Dr. Haroon Steven, and Nicole Espinoza. But first, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Chris Ewey. Thank you very much. And I just want to really say thank you, thank you, thank you to our presenters today who are honing their craft and sharing that knowledge with others. Um, and to the people who are here to learn about that. Uh, I feel so privileged to work at an institution whose job is to enrich the lives of 30,000 students who come to learn what you as professors and faculty members know and can teach them how to do. But the transmission of that knowledge is not a trivial task and the building of those skills is not a trivial task. And I think this event is what it, it's kind of the hallmark of what it means to be a professional. as someone who cares enough about their craft to hone it, to learn about what best practices are, to share those, and to come and continue this process of improvement of, of the activity. And so I'm so appreciative of the people who are sharing these best practices and the people who are here to learn about these best practices so that they continue to hone their own craft. So I don't want to take any more of the time away from the presenters, and so I will stop there and hand it to my uh, colleague here, uh, Janet Dufek, our Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs, who helps to uh, empower this work as well. Thank you. Uh, before we get to the certificate awarding, I'd like to say a couple words uh, to people online and those here. Uh, I was amazed with the contemporary nature of the posters and the topics that you all are sharing. I had to uh, jot down some of the keys in, in viewing the posters that, as, as Melissa said, are available online through Digital Scholar. Uh, cultural, culturally relevant uh, journal articles in engineering. So we've got some DEI uh, best practices. Uh, promoting active learning online. Obviously, this is something that we're all trying to work toward in, in the classroom. Marrying teaching and technology. So here we are in a, a hybrid flex room. It's great. This one really, I really like this one. Automated grading tools for computer programming. That's, 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 putting the pieces together, right? Being more efficient with what you're doing and yet being right on the cutting edge. And then the last example that I want to call uh, your attention to is one that I found very intriguing. It was a present, it is a presentation or a technique where the instructor is doing a live and virtual uh, synchronous lecture and a secondary instructor, and I happen to recognize his name, so a graduate student is, is actively inter engaging the students through chat. So the person who's giving the live lecture, you know, is not stuck on that 
on that screen, but yet gets the information and can address uh, immediately the questions and the comments of the students. So those are just a couple that caught my eye. There were many, many others that were uh, splendid topics and very much cutting edge and contemporary. And I commend all of you for taking that approach with what you're sharing here. So again, uh, not only the, the panelists, but for those of you that participated in, in the posters, thank you. And as Provost Evie said, thank you for sharing your expertise. So we do have certificates for our distinguished presenters today. Amanda, who's joining us remotely. This is it, it's gonna be in your office. Congratulations, Amanda. Yes. <laughs> And uh, Katie Rafferty. Thank you, Dr. Herman Stevens. Oh, my evening. Weird. Pleased to meet you face to face. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you. All right. So, um, our first panelist today. Very excited to turn it right over to Dr. Amanda Pazinski from Psychology. And uh, they are going to share their screen. So I will stop sharing right now and just turn it over to you, Amanda. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm going to uh, very quickly uh, switch over to my screen. All right. So, hello everyone. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to be here today. And I hope I can spend my time introducing you to a possible new tool for your courses. So anyone who utilizes text-based discussions, so uh, the typical Canvas discussion boards in either their online or hybrid courses may consider them to be somewhat of a necessary evil uh, you need students to engage with each other like they would in an in-person course because discussion fosters deeper understanding and the challenging exchange of ideas. But unless you're teaching a fully synchronous online course, then it's likely your students won't even see each other, much less interact with each other and share those valuable experiences in a meaningful way. And if you are teaching synchronously, even if you require that cameras be on during class, which presents its own issues, uh, you may notice that it's still a struggle to get students to engage. And you can run into the same issues as in-person classes, where the same small number of students just dominate the conversation. And making discussions is hard, but making pedagogically good discussions is even harder. So some students just focus only on the word count and they don't engage with their uh, classmates or the material. They just sort of copy and paste from the book and call it good. Uh, sometimes everybody basically just says the same thing and then virtually pats each other on the back. And if students can't see their classmates, they also don't know if they're alone, if they'll be safe to share personal anecdotes or lived experiences. So these are all barriers to the goals of imitating in-person discussions. So we're looking for a way for all students to engage with each other, to exchange well thought out ideas and to respond to prompts that ask them questions that require them to think. And if I find something that does that 100% all of the time, I will let you know. Uh, but until then, I do have a fairly good alternative. So um, there are a few options for asynchronous discussion posts. Uh, some folks may have heard of VoiceThread, but I've chosen to use a free app called Flipgrid. So Flipgrid integrates uh, with Canvas and the SpeedGrader, so you can use all the rubrics and comments you want, and it can be used on mobile and desktop. It uses the microphone and the camera to create and customize videos based on instructor prompts. Uh, and this may sound a little vague and sort of like, oh, well, okay, but how does this work? Uh, so 
I made a little bit of a empty uh, demonstration shell uh, just to give you a better overview of what you can expect. So it's highly customizable. You can see that you can customize sort of headers. Uh, you can add GIFs uh, to make your posts more attention grabbing and unique. Uh, you can also add uh, a lead. They call it a lead. Uh, this can be a GA or TA that can help you grade. So you can add or other instructors if you would like. So very customizable, very uh, personalizable. So let's start off really quick. Uh, this is what I show to all of my students at the beginning of the semester. Everyone has to do this. So uh, all of these discussions are created natively in Canvas. Uh, you set up an integration, you add an assignment just like you would any other way in Canvas, uh, but you set it up as an external tool. This will embed itself into uh, what you see on Canvas. Students can then uh, click a button. It will take them here to record. So I'm going to shut off my camera real quick just to make sure that this works appropriately. So here we go. This is what you would see uh, if you were a student or instructor getting ready to create a Flipgrid. So there are a lot of different options that you can use. So for instance, uh, if you want to take a look at the, in, the actual assignment instructions, uh, you can pull it up here. If you're a student and you're thinking, oh, that's that's a lot, maybe I should just write down the important stuff, like uh, I need to type in my name, I need to, so uh, they can create bullet point lists, they can create a script if they would like, uh, which is incredibly helpful for students uh, with uh, a neurotypical uh, orientations or uh, if they are just uh, very socially anxious. There are a number of different uh, personalizable options. If you're familiar with Zoom or WebEx, then uh, the customizable backgrounds, also an option. Uh, there are a lot of effects as well. So for instance, if I uh, prefer people not to notice that I'm looking at a second monitor, uh, when I have this pulled up, I can perhaps uh, add some stickers or some flair. Right. It, it's been that one year anniversary of the uh, Zoom lawyer that says, I am not a cat. So I felt like this was appropriate. Uh, you can also add some um, more efficient tools to this as well. For instance, you have a whiteboard. Uh, you can add uh, photos. For instance, if you want to add a specific photo or a slide, you can pop that up on the video and then uh, reference it as you are talking. You can add text or just doodle on the screen or just do the full on whiteboard. So uh, you can also see this is a default time up in the upper uh, right corner. Uh, it's sort of set to five minutes, but you can set this anywhere from a minute to 10 minutes. So if you want to do a very quick conversation or a longer presentation. So let's give a quick overview of what this would actually look like. Gives you a countdown. Hello everyone, I'm Amanda, and this is a demonstration. So right off the bat, you can see how long that took. Um, you can say, oh, you know what? I stuttered or I missed something or that I, I had a cat come off screen and interrupt everything. Uh, let me retake it. So if you are a student with social anxiety, the option to retake it over and over until you get something that you find appropriate is incredibly helpful. So it will autoplay when I move next. So sorry about this. So you can also edit very similar to what you may have seen on other types of programs. If I notice, oh, well, you know what? I, I looked away at the last part. Let me cut that out. Uh, you can uh, scrub through all the stuff that you normally would uh, do. Uh, you can tell that the, so even though this is on my screen, it's not showing up in the video as well, uh, at all, uh, neither will the notes. So we can confirm this. So uh, there's some other options. Say I'm a student and I realize, oh, I missed an important point of the prompt. I can add another clip uh, right here so I don't have to redo the entire thing. 
uh, I can, as an instructor or a student, uh, record uh, my screen instead. Maybe I want to give a quick introduction and then move on to PowerPoints. Um, let's see. So once that is done, you can customize uh, what you need. Add, uh, again, customization and uh, personalization are the hallmarks here. Uh, you can post, generally speaking, very quick, especially for a five second uh, video. Go back and uh, this is now uh, present. All students could see this. Every time a student uh, adds their video, it shows up here in the list, which is viewable both here in Flipgrid and natively on Canvas. Uh, you can also see videos directly in the speed grader. You also have some options. So let's say that uh, you want to do a default for multiple classes. You can duplicate this uh, for multiple classes wherever you would like to put it. Uh, you can add closed captioning if you would like to make these videos uh, accessible, which are uh, very, very helpful. Uh, and it does do an automatic caption as well as an import caption feature. So you can also download it if you want to put this on the front page of your Canvas uh, module. Right. So uh, it also has an option. So when you delete them, uh, you, you do have to confirm. So there's no accidental deleting of student videos which is nice. So let's see. Uh, this is just a basic overview of what you can do with it. But um, specifically, there's two general types of Flipgrid prompts that I use in my courses. And they're generally based on what skills I want my students to learn from them. So I have assignments that are based more on practicing skills, uh, specifically with research communication and other assignments based on building competency with course material. So why practice? Well, if psychology students want to successfully get into grad school, they need to meet some basic re requirements and expectations. So yes, they need to know about psychology, uh, but they do need some additional skills like experience in a research lab or poster presentations. So students need to break down complicated topics that they are interested in and discuss them with peers. Absolutely no one wants to do this. It's terrifying. So we need to gradually build this skill with low stakes replicable practice. So this is my 200 level uh, um, psychology statistics course. So I want them to understand learning objectives and be able to summarize what they learned over the week. Uh, they're doing plenty of calculations to build those skills on their own, but can they explain why they're doing them and what they tell us? So I asked them to pretend, uh, to pretend that a student missed class. How would they describe what that student missed in a way that's helpful to them? Can they break down those statistical methods into less technical terms? And then for responses, they pretend that they're the ones that missed class. What type of follow-up questions would they ask their peers? So I have a very simple rubric. You can see it's five points, uh, three for an initial point and uh, uh, initial post, and then one point for uh, two responses. Very easy to grade. You can embed this here or in a rubric as well in Canvas. Um, very, very simple, low stakes. Uh, this is very similar to a participation grade where you would just like hand students a piece of paper in class and like, okay, answer these questions that I have up on the screen, right? So very simple, uh, very straightforward. Uh, this is for a 300 level course, uh, Foundations in Neuroscience. Uh, this one prepares them for conferences by having them identify their favorite topic for the past two weeks and just nerd out about it. So, um, what excited them over that content? What just sort of clicked to them? Uh, why might that material be relevant to them in the future? And then they can engage with their peers. Their responses can say things like, oh, I totally saw this YouTube video about it. Here, let me post that and let, we can talk about that. Or, oh, hey, we learned about this in another course, but we approached it from uh, behaviorism versus biology. And I thought it was really interesting, right? So you can have them be engaged and excited about what they're learning and practice these applicable transferable skills. 
You can also have them do uh, some brainstorming or peer review. This is for a capstone course uh, where they have to come up with some uh, paper presentation concepts. Um, students come up with ideas for either an experiment or a correlational study, and then they have a list of questions they can ask their peers, like, uh, is there a better population to use than the one I picked? Uh, and then uh, for their responses, they go and answer those questions for their peers. So you can use Flipgrid for brainstorming and peer review, but you can't have Canvas set up the peer review like you would normally. Uh, unfortunately, they can still be assigned by hand, and there is an option to have Flipgrid do it, but it won't uh, merge with the speed reader. So that is one of the downsides that I have found. So you can see how these can be replicable. You can see how uh, they would be good for um, um, building something that's easy to grade, easy to post. Uh, but we do have some more content-based applications. So uh, this is a 400 level learning course. They find a YouTube video of an animal doing a cool trick and then they break down how you would shape that trick uh, using a process called task analysis, which they learn about earlier in the week. Uh, then their replies focus on pretending to be that animal and how could they screw this up for the uh, trainer, right? You're teaching a cat to jump through your arms and you put your arm out so they have to walk over it. Well, what happens if that cat walks behind you, right? So brings up the fragility of uh, task analysis and how you need to be very flexible when shaping. And then we have something on machine learning. Uh, this is for my cognitive psych course. They find an example of a neural network that does something hilarious like name guinea pigs uh, after watching a TED talk uh, from uh, Janelle Shane who uh, trains these uh, neural nets to do this. So they uh, figure out what data sets go into this network, what comes out and why it might have gone hilariously wrong. Uh, for instance, Pop Chop and Buzzberry are great guinea pig names. Uh, but fleshy and butty blurney uh, are less so. So responses can focus on additional data sets uh, and how to fine tune the results, uh, like requiring only English words, or they can just laugh for 30 seconds about how an AI thought Hanger Dan was a good uh, guinea pig. So hopefully no matter what you teach, there's a way that you can apply these examples. Uh, and these examples do tend to go very well with uh, students. So students are uh, usually a bit more cautious uh, at the beginning, but by the end of the semester, they love them. They think it's a great way to make online courses more personable. It helps them practice both professional and academic skills. And overall, they're just fun. Who doesn't like naming guinea pigs, right? So uh, I have on uh, my presentation, if you wanna take a, a quicker look at this as well, um, there's a lot of different evidence that it based students. A lot of this uh, is, again, evidence based, uh, a lot of best practices. So um, it can be uh, applied to a variety of different course applications and modified for different disciplines. So I also have some resources, uh, both QR codes, if you want to take pictures of them, or uh, you can access them on the links. So how to sign up for Flipgrid, how to integrate it with Canvas. And I did make a resource page uh, if you want some more information, if you want some more details, and uh, how to set this up in your course in a way that is um, uh, considerably smoother uh, than it might otherwise be. So uh, that is it on my end. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So yeah. thank you, Amanda. Um, what an interesting way to to like make it more personal because those discussion threads can get a little boring right um what questions do you all have for amanda again you can raise your hand in the room or on zoom or put your question in the chat katie yes a question about scalability. How large are your classes and do you think this could apply to some, you know, a hundred student class? Oh yeah, so uh, usually my classes are about uh, 35 to 45 uh, in that sort of range. Um, so this tends to work very well for that. If you're doing something like a participation grade, uh, this would work perfectly. Or if you're trying to set up a sort of peer review and you follow it up with additional materials, uh, say like you have a uh, an assessment form for how well people did peer reviews, 
uh, then this can definitely apply to a much larger class. Can you set up sub flip grids so that you just group the students? So only these 12 students or 10 students participate together? Yes, so that is definitely how you would set it up in Flipgrid itself. Um, that is the problem. It doesn't automatically send that information back to Canvas, so it ends up separating it from uh, the speed grader. So there's a little bit of an issue with that, but you can actually do that in Flipgrid itself. Question. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you so much, Amanda. All right, I'll unshare and uh, we can move on. <laughs> Hello, everyone in the room and online. Thank you for coming. I'm Katie Rafferty. I'm in the Department of Life Sciences. Um, my courses tend towards very large courses, so um, 100 students or up. And uh, my particular poster is in an effort to promote science literacy or, you know, more plainly, just make it, give the students some training reading science literature. So in our department, we often present our students with peer-reviewed publications in upper-level classes, but they haven't really had a lot of training on how to approach these articles. So this approach is a way to answer that need. Um, we also know that for science students, they, they tend to stay in and persist in our majors if they identify as scientists. And we have some peers that allow students to actually do, you know, wet lab research to gain skills that are of a scientist. But, you know, most of our students can't take those just because those courses are small enrollment. And so there are ways such as getting them comfortable reading scientific literature to promote that science identity. Um, and we can hit all of our students. So this is one method to do it. Um, originally, I would bring papers into the classroom and try to have some discussions, but I found that they were um, surface discussions. In addition to the content I needed to teach for those lectures, I couldn't really get in depth on some of these articles as I wanted to. And so I, um, I attended an Office of Online Education workshop on meaningful discussions and using the discussion feature in Canvas and was really inspired and knew that I could take what I learned from that workshop and apply it to my class. So um, basically what I have done is this is a low stakes assignment, participation based assignment in my course. And um, I have selected articles, some of them are peer reviewed uh, and some of them are science blogs. One of them is on sequencing Ozzy Osbourne's DNA. Um, he has quite um, an interesting genome. He has some what we call private alleles, which are DNA sequences that, that aren't common. And his story is interesting because despite um, you know, substance abuse and addiction, multiple uh, plane crashes and uh, some serious trauma, um, his ability to focus on career and his, his voice has not diminished, um, and he has lived a quite robust life. So he clearly has some interesting sequences that are kind of supporting his success, his physiological success. Um, so you have to give the students something that they enjoy, right? You know, if I don't want to give them all just pretty in-depth scientific literature. So um, the, the way I roll out the deliverables is based on practices that again, I, I learned in this um, uh, UNLV Office for Online Ed workshop where it's, I kind of have defined a very clear path 
of tasks. So first is identifying what type of source is this? Is it primary? Is it secondary? You know, just so they identify the types of sources of scientific information that are out there. Then I'm not actually trying to get them to identify concepts, um, but give them a process to approach reading these articles. So some of it is just, what is the objective? It's as simple as that. What is the objective? And uh, what are some of the concepts and vocabulary words that you see mapping from our course to this article or this article to our course? And one of the major things I asked them to identify are what sections did you actually find easy to read? You know, they, they didn't make you uncomfortable. You felt like you could get it. And then what sections were really difficult? Um, and I don't actually expect them to, to even read into those deep, difficult sections, but just to acknowledge what are the tricky parts and why? You know, what, what is the barrier to you kind of getting through that work? So they have to, there's maybe five things that they include in that post and then the peer response. One of the peer responses is, Teach the person you're responding to, how did you approach this section easy? So it truly is just coaching students on how to read an article um, and, and not really expecting them to go through the methods and analyze results. That's not my goal um, for this particular genetics class that I roll out this assignment in. And so some of the data we can see, I have a pre-semester and a post-semester uh, survey, just asking them, do you have strategies to read scientific literature? And then a number of just a, a word selection field that asks them, you know, how do you feel? So I, I, on the screen, I put up just the front page of a scientific article. Um, and I don't want them to read it. I just say, look at this front page and tell me which of these words are mapping to how you feel. And um, if you look at the poster, the white bars are the start of term words that were selected, and the black bars are the end of term. So some of these words like, um, you know, interested is the first one. So those don't really change. That's good. These are science students. I think that they should be interested in some of these articles, whether or not they feel you know, happy to approach them. At the bottom left, you see challenged. That didn't change. That's excellent. Um, third from the bottom, overwhelmed. Right. So they started out the white bar, you know, 60% of students. Thank you, Melissa, for using the pointer. 60% um, were overwhelmed, but that number went down to 20% at the end. And that truly is the goal. Students will have to approach these papers as they advance in their classes. Um, we can feel challenged. We can um, feel like this is not something I actually want to do. But it still is skills that they need to learn to identify as scientists. And so if we can remove that overwhelming feeling in the middle, there's anxious, um, the engaged uh, bar, which is, yeah, thank you. That went up a little bit more, right? Um, and prepared, if you scroll up, prepared went up from 20% to about 60%. And so to me, this assignment um, did what it needed to do. And it was very easy to roll out using the discussion feature of Canvas. I had, um, you know, 100 or so students. I grouped them into groups of typically seven to 10. 10 is a good group number because um, sometimes students will miss the assignment or, you know, they'll, they'll drop out at the end, by the end of the semester. So those groups do tend to shrink in size. So you want to start with something a little bit bigger. And, and overall, it was an effective easy way for me to deliver my course content in lecture, talk about these articles during lecture in, the, in terms of 
this is the discussion article that you guys are going to be talking about online today. You know, this is how it relates to what we're doing. And so, and, and also there was flexibility. So I gave six, five or six articles throughout the semester and the students only had to complete, you know, four or five of them. So it gave them flexibility on weeks when they just couldn't get this work done. That was okay. So they knew they had flexibility there. Um, and so, and then the data show that it was a successful rollout. So I think it's very generalizable to all subjects. Um, certainly you could change it to make it more specific to the actual article itself if you wanted your students to truly work on um, you know, extracting the results from the methods that they see or the data figures that they see. You know, it's very tunable to your needs for your students. And um, I'd like to acknowledge the Office of Online Edge Ed for the workshop on discussions, um, which is you know, where I really got these best practices and I had they have lovely templates to start from. So I was not putting this together from scratch. And then in addition, our sciences librarians, I know all of our field specific librarians are very great, but I had some good discussion with um, the tasks that I was asking my students to do in the discussions. I went over those with the sciences librarians to kind of make sure that um, they were um, effective and part of best practices. And actually one way to improve this, which I thought was really interesting is, um, if I wanted to extend this, uh, uh, Brittany Fiedler, one of our, our librarians, they're not specifically sciences, she said, if you could extend this to a more social impact by then looking at any type of kind of social media surrounding these articles. So are some of them uh, more cited than others? Are some of them, you know, do some of the faculty have Twitter uh, presences and things like that? I thought that is something I never would have considered. Um, I sit kind of squarely in my, my faculty bin. I don't, I, I, I don't go into the, the social media world that much, but it, it applies to many of these articles, especially if it's something that's really moving the needle in the field. So I thought that's a really interesting extension of this so with that, I'll take questions if there are any. Other than, if not, thank you very much for your uh, for listening. Questions about Ozzy Osbourne or science <laughs> literacy? Thank you. That was really a neat uh, assignment and some great outcomes. So congratulations on that. My question is about the uh, piece where you asked them what's the most difficult section in the journal article for you to comprehend or read or whatever. Just from your observation, uh, my guess would be results and statistics. Is that what you saw? Methods, usually. The, the methods were, you know, because that's when they had technical terms and processes that they have never been exposed to. And I should elaborate on that. I, I think what I actually say in the assignment is, what part did you find difficult, but also that you felt you could skip? <laughs> skip <laughs> the you know, when we read these articles, we don't read the whole thing. Um, also that you felt that you could skip to truly understand the purpose of the article. You, you may have already answered that question, but maybe a little bit of elaboration. I struggle with identifying the articles that cover the topics that I'm trying to explain to them. Usually the articles are either too complex for them or they have terms that they haven't been exposed to yet. Did you have any special strategy to find the articles that will be applied to what you're trying to do? No, finding the articles is the hardest part. So, um, you know, I subscribe to Scientific American. So if I saw something in there that matched kind of what we were doing, and I usually do, um, and I thought, oh, this is great. And, and you know, it's it's from a journalist point of view, so there's some nice backstory, and those were the ones that the students were working on. There's other topics, um, DNA replication. I remember one I really just struggled to find an article, and even 
I'm, I'm not even sure it's the best one to, to be using, but it had a lot of terminology and, um, and we definitely struggled more with that one. But again, it's just the process. It's not the content itself. That's the purpose of this exercise. Um, but yes, that, that's the hardest part on the instructor's side is finding the articles that are appropriate. Um, Amanda says in the chat, nature and science articles tend to be nice and short, fairly accessible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The length is important. The length is important. It is, and uh, at once I gave, one time I gave a longer article and then I say only focus on this section. What I, I thought that there was something interested in, interesting embedded in it, but no, I was not gonna present that with that. Any other questions for Katie? Thank you so much. You. And I know you have to go, so. All right, well, next we have Haroon, and Haroon, I'm going to give you the uh, clicker. In the chat box, I get free. And All right, thank you. Um, I'm Haroon Stephen. I'm with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. First of all, I'd like to thank the, for this opportunity to uh, speak. And I think uh, best uh, practices, uh, uh, best teaching practices expo is a great opportunity for us to share as well as learn from each other. So my uh, teaching practice uh, it's about engaging students in a glossary development, learning retention. So glossary or glossary, wherever you're from. Um, and I think this quote by Warren Buffett kind of captures what my intent is. Bad terminology is the enemy of good thinking. And uh, I've seen this happen to myself quite frequently. If I don't know the terms, building the concepts that are founded on those terms becomes very difficult. And sometimes uh, it even takes me into the wrong direction. So that was my uh, thinking process behind it. And what this glossary development um, addresses is the, the specific, some very specific needs in, in my uh, courses, which are in the Department of Civil Engineering. So first of all, my, my goal was to help students remember the technical terms uh, that are going to be used to build concepts. Uh, then also to facilitate them to create this habit of reflection after the lesson, um, which strengthens and adds value to the information that they have learned in the class. Next, I also wanted to make sure that uh, they can share their knowledge with others, which, which I think we are generally doing through different um, instruments. And lastly, this uh, activity would help them better comprehend the engineering concept. So I have this, uh, I'm no expert in memory and brain, but this was my kind of uh, uh, simple diagram of once they receive information through the sensory uh, inputs, it goes into short-term memory. But if it is not, uh, if, if, if there are no reasons for that memory to be held, it will go away, it's volatile. So we need to create activities that will add value to that information so it becomes important. And so the brain will try to keep it. So here is the rationale behind it. The information is integrated into long-term memory through a couple of activities. And here are some examples. There is repetition. If you keep doing it again and again, it will be repeated. If we just sit down and reflect upon it, uh, which is deep thinking, we tend to retain it. If we try to share it with others, we speak or we write um, or in any other form of communication, we tend to retain it. Um, and lastly, if we just try to organize that information into different uh, schemes or classification, that also helps us uh, build better connection between that information and our existing information. And so all of these to me are value adding activities. They add value to the information, which makes it important. 
our brain will say, oh, this is important information. I better save it, save it or, or keep it for future. So what did I do? Um, I, I, I implemented this practice in the summer uh, and fall semesters last year in two of my courses. Um, and these courses, uh, the summer course was a small size class, but the fall class was uh, a large class. So overall, there were about 90 students who participated in this activity. And the activity was very simple. It was a, an individual uh, graded assignment and each student was to develop a glossary of terms and definitions. Um, and the uh, criteria for, for success was that they must at least add five definitions at the, uh, at the end of each lesson. And by the end of the semester, they should have at least 200 definitions in their glossary. Now that was, these, this was just a, a criteria to have a minimum limit, but on the other end, they could go wild and just put as many definitions as they felt like would contribute to their learning. But what I really emphasized to these students, pretty much every lesson, at the end of the lesson, I will remind it to them. And I will emphasize to them that here is your opportunity to retain this information. You could, of course, you have another class, you might have to leave, but spend 10 minutes, identify the key definitions that you have learned today and write down in your own words what they mean to you. So I gathered the evidence for, uh, for, uh, for the, the, uh, the benefits of this practice in a couple of ways. Most importantly, post-semester survey, that's what I did. I also uh, reviewed the individual submissions by students and tried to learn from it that how students were writing down what I taught them. That was also a, 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 an important thing for me to understand, okay, this is how I spoke it, this is how, how they wrote it. So what are some of the ways I can teach better? So it was very, an, a very uh, informative for me. And lastly, I also had informal conversations with them during office hours and trying to learn how they are approaching this assignment. So the survey data was uh, was a 79% response rate, which was pretty high. And one of the reasons it's very high because it was a graded survey. <laughs> so I realized that later, but uh, at the same time, I got a lot of feedback from students. Um, so there were four questions. Will, did this assignment help in the understanding of the terms? Did this help in the uh, help in explaining the concepts uh, better? Did it should it be included in this course next round, and should it be included in other civil engineering courses? And eighty seven percent of the students said they really it really helped them understand the technical terms better. Um, Eighty three percent students said that it actually helped them in their. Uh, conceptual understanding of engineering uh, principles. 72% students said that they would like to see this assignment again in a course. And 63% said that they would like to see it in other engineering courses as well. So based upon this limited uh, sample set, I feel that students are benefiting from glossary development. There is a couple of uh, comments from students that I chose to share. So the first one, it, it really helped them understand and memorize concepts. So memorization is the key that was the, the intent. Uh, the other students uh, also kind of emphasize that it, it could help the student in future um, career or job because these are the terms that they will be using uh, in many years. And the last one, it kind of, that it was hard to keep up with it. Because I, and I understood some of the students had classes right after my class. And it may be hard for them to, uh, to do, especially if they have to walk uh, a certain amount of distance to get to the other class. So how can this be, uh, uh, others can adopt this practice? It can be included as a graded assignment. Um, you can decide an appropriate number of definitions or terms to be added per lesson or per week. And there could be a minimum expectation uh, per semester. Uh, most importantly, I think students must understand and agree with the instructor why this activity is beneficial for them. Because once they realize, they will do it. They, you won't have to even ask them. So I, I had to repeat it 
first couple of weeks, but then I realized that, and I was looking at their, these were shared documents by them. So I could anytime see how the progress of their work. And the uh, first couple of weeks I had to push, but then I saw that they, a lot of them just caught up, caught up and they were doing it on their own. Uh, it's nice to provide a template so that they know what is being expected because groceries can be all, all, all sorts of shapes and uh, 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 styles. And lastly, um, I don't have really the answer for the perfect way to implement it. <laughs> Keep trying changing it. So uh, try different variations and I'm pretty sure one of these will fit to, to, to meet the, the, the needs of your class. So I would like to acknowledge where this idea came from. So I learned this um, uh, through, from, through the culturally responsive and relevant teaching workshop. It's CRRT offered by the Transcend Project uh, in the Civil Engineering Department. And last two years, it has been offered to college and department, but next two years, it will be offered uh, UNLV uh, to all you know, UNLV faculty. So the next offering is in 2022. So I would highly encourage you to, to take advantage. There are eight modules, one per month, and uh, very informative. I, I learned a lot of things about teaching uh, through this workshop. And lastly, a couple of resources. I have these, uh, this assignment as well as the survey uh, in the form of share documents, and they are on my poster, clickable links as well. And feel free to use those. Um, you can always contact me if uh, I can provide any additional information. And thank you. I'll stop for any questions. Yes, Janet. Turn, uh, you know, it's seemingly simple concept, but obviously very effective. I think you gave this information, you gave the course numbers, but uh, I, you went. So I was curious how advanced in the content were the students when they were being used in glossary terms? For example, you know, freshman terms or freshman knowledge versus junior student. So I had two courses. One is 400 level course, which is an elective. So these students, uh, have taken most of their junior and some senior level courses as well. Um, and the other course was 300 level course. So that's um, more of the junior. And so we were students that had been in the engineering environment for you know, a couple of years. Yes. Great. Thank you. Did you have any pushback about this being like a, a busy work assignment for students? Yes, there were some students who complained. <laughs> I think it's busy work. I think it's very, very valuable. Um, but I could see, you know, some students just really having the, the pushback. Yes, yeah. there was some pushback. Um, my strategy was to explain it to them that they are looking at it as an high effort work. I took it as a low stake, low effort work. Um, I explained it to them. There is no wrong answer. You're telling in that document, what you feel or what you think you understood from it. So there is no wrong answer. I'm just trying to understand if you understand it and you're trying to articulate it so it becomes a permanent memory. Yes, one. Can you comment a little bit more how this assignment is culturally relevant? That part, I'm not sure because the, the, the workshop is culturally relevant. So there, the context was to it's a faculty development workshop and it covers a wide range. It covers um, inclusion, it covers diversity and uh, universal learning design. So there are many aspects. So this came under the aspect of uh, universal learning design. And especially this was the presentation, one of our UNLV faculty. It was about when we are in a classroom with students, we have to first learn each other's language. So we have to agree upon terms and what they mean before we start building concepts. So that was the idea. And this was my assignment to, to uh, as part of the work, uh, attending that workshop to come up with a strategy that I can apply in my classroom. So I chose this. I'm not sure culturally how to make it culturally relevant at this point. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. It does strike me as a really inclusive practice because it helps students see themselves 
as engineers, right? Because they're developing the language of engineers, which they don't necessarily have when they come into the classroom. Agreed. Yes. So that that could be one way to look at it. That is definitely offline. So students are not not feeling pressure. So different level of learning. They're all participating. Equally. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And Nicole, you can take over the mic on the group. Uh, my name is Nicole Espinosa. I'm actually the online program coordinator at the School of Public Health. Um, I'm a little bit different because I work with faculty members, but this is a very transferable and translatable um, practice for everything. So um, we, I'm going to talk particularly about a program and how we use Canvas rubrics within that program. I wanted to first kind of ask some questions to you guys um and you don't have to write anything down you don't have to say anything just um in your mind do you actually use canvas rubrics so if that's a yes this is probably a good one for you to use canvas outcomes for mastery learning probably not but i put a little picture of of the home rubrics and outcomes there is a little outcomes tab in canvas i implore you just to click on it at some point and then are you looking ways to assess the students over the entire um, course if you're it's an individual course this will be helpful for you are you looking ways to assess students over a master course so for example first year seminars i can see this being helpful um, english 101 classes that use rubrics so somehow a master course that you want to assess and make sure that the students are attaining and then me what we did is assess the students throughout an entire program. So I am UNLV School of Public Health. We have two departments. We have the Healthcare Administration and Policy Department, which is the MHA. And the MHA program, this is a little bit of what we did. Um, this is a two-year process now. Um, and I said accreditation rose because this is really what our accrediting bodies just love this last time. But it is, like I said, very transferable to any course and any level that you can. So here's kind of our steps. We needed faculty support. All of them used Canvas rubrics. We just need to add a little bit to it. So in this case, we added the competencies. For every accreditation body, we usually have a certain amount of competencies. We know this in undergrad, it's ULOs. Um, for us, it's our CAMI accreditation or competencies. Uh, so we had to add them in. So we had to have a little bit of faculty buy-in, so a little bit of support measurements there. And then we had to discuss about the um, mastery level. Then it has to be administrative support. So you have to have somebody like me or somebody that can get in there, a coordinator of some kind to make the rubrics, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Then we can collect and analyze the data, and you're going to see some of that data over a two-year process. It's pretty cool how much data there is. And then hopefully we can make some changes on that. And that's what step we're at right now. We're actually in the ad hoc committee right now, kind of coming up with some data informed changes that we can do for our, um, our entire program. So just real quick about faculty support. Now, I know this is super small, um, but I wanted to mention that this just looks like a classic rubric. And the first top, top portion is the content, content. So what you regularly are using in any Canvas. So what I did with the faculty members then is just added a bottom portion, which is the competency levels. So in the EMHA, which is one of our master's degree, executive master's degree programs, we added these five different competencies. We gave it low stakes, one point, so that it has some point value to it. And we added these competencies in there directly into it. We just asked the faculty member, where can we get five of your points? That's about the the biggest kind of load they have to do from there we had to talk about what mastery means to them so in a master's of healthcare administration they decided that a mastery because it's a master's it should be 95 to 100 percent it's highly competent a competent range would be about 86 to 94 percent and then nearing competency would be anything lower than 85 percent of course this can change 
And in fact, I gave you a good job aid um, for this. It's a ULO rubric template that looks somewhat like this. That you can do it for any undergrad. Um, all of it's it's already it's in Google Slides, but um, sorry, Google Sheets, but it's it's automatic, so you can just plug in the ULOs in there, which is super nice. Um, so in that ULO template, you're welcome to come up with your own. You just have to click, um, or in my poster, there's that scan. So from there, we had to create it. So this is kind of the big push for me. And yes, it did take a while. And as an administrator on Canvas, you had to have a little Canvas expertise. We had to go through every single one of the courses. We had to make what's called a, a Canvas outcome. These outcomes are global outcomes. What that means is that they go throughout the entire um, system. They exist. Um, and the students can actually see them. So in particular, this one is healthcare payment system. They can see it in any course that they have about healthcare payment system. So every course will have this rubric or could possibly have this rubric within an assignment. Um, so we put those in there. We had to, a little, a little lead way to put them in there. We had to make the Canvas rubrics. We had to do some training to faculty to make sure they know how to do rubrics in Canvas. They're just typical rubrics in Canvas though. So no big list there since a lot of them were using that. And then we also had to create student resources. So the reason why these Canvas outcomes, and you can know a Canvas outcomes because it has a little target symbol um, right by the number there, the EMHAA4. Um, these um, are outcomes and what happens is the students can actually see these in what's called a student mastery learning gradebook in Canvas. So it's an automatic thing. They just don't know how to get to it because none of us use it, right? So we have to give them a little bit support to show them how to get to these, these learning outcomes and how, we can, how they can see what mastery level they're at. So it takes time. It does take time, but a lot of it now is just ongoing. So it's an ongoing process. I did it two years ago. We did change our competencies a little bit. We're also adding EMHA. So there's a little maintenance of it, but it really just takes a little time at the beginning, but now it just kind of moves. Everything gets copied over from the original course. Everything kind of um, goes into there and data is just collected automatically with every one of the assignments. So um, that being said, we compiled data for the last two years and we're a small program. MHA usually has about 10, 15 per per semester, so maybe about 25 in a full calendar year. But in two years, we collected 1,400 data points for those students. So every student probably had about five competencies in each one, maybe, maybe one major assignment in there, and we collected 1,400. And this is where we're at right now, is we're pulling the data, these 1,400 um, on there. And this is where we can talk about it, and maybe some in the chat can see something like in this preliminary data, which is just simple stats. All I did was pull it in Canvas. Canvas actually pulls it as a CSV. I cleaned it up a little bit in an Excel file. Um, what, what do you see about um, the data here? Like, what can you tell me just looking at this data, not knowing anything other than the competency levels? What can you tell? It seems like it's, uh, it's competent, but most of them are not highly competent. Yeah, so lots and lots of competency, but not a lot of highly competent. Anything else? Like, look at the competency count. That means that's how many times it's been assessed. Like, look at C7. Over a two-year period, it's been assessed twice. So that is telling, too, that maybe we need to step it up a little bit or put it in another assignment in there because we're not getting good competency levels in there. Sheila says some standards are obviously addressed much more than others. Yes, as you can see, the big one or big guy is effective written oral and presentation skills. Totally makes sense. Most of them are projects, papers, stuff like that. So this does make sense. So in the preliminary data, just very simple data, you can see how, how effective it is that we can do it as both an instructor and a faculty member. Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. You would know that going in that you would have one competency that was only being assessed a few times. Because it's on a matrix, yes. But that also means 
right? Yeah. That, that one actually is kind of, you can adjust your rubrics to it too. So that one is actually a elective course. And this elective course is often taught by a, a part-time instructor who probably didn't do it every semester. And it's only taught every other semester. So it's only taught. And it's a 431, 631 course, which means it's not often taught too. But it was taught more than one time. So I'm guessing it should probably have about at least six data points, but that probably means we shouldn't have an elective course, right? Right, or, and holding the instructors accountable for assessing the things. Yeah, and holding instructors accountable. We're trying to help that by making it pretty seamless. So we've noticed that in the last two years, we had to kind of fix that. And now I just wanted to show you about, it's not working now. Student data. So this is just students. So now I pulled, and I that was all just competency. Now I just pulled one student. You can see a lot on this student. You can see, for one thing, that they're not doing so hot on quant skills. This is very important, and this is what where our next step is. Before they hit their culminating exam, culminating project, because this is mostly project based. Before they hit their internship, maybe we need to address why their quantitative skills are so low. And maybe their project and their questions can assess that. So we are working on that to help with that kind of a student example too. So one student and how they're assessed. She, they have a 43 different amounts. So they're probably further into their, into their program right now. So this is probably over a, at least probably 10 classes. So now we can start looking at that student and seeing how we can help that student get better, and maybe we can even support that student in what they are doing really good on, which would be like systems thinking. So they are doing really good on that. So let's, let's figure out a way to help them with quantitative skills and systems thinking, which is what's an important practice, at least that we're trying to do. So and just to add just a little bit, you can add demographics to the data. So this is just a little bit of a task by asking my program coordinator to give me GPAs and whether or not they took the GRE or not. And we did see just the small data, they're small data points, so don't think too much of it. We started um, as a fall, uh, fall 2020 is when we had GRE was test optional. So starting fall 2020 is when they didn't have to take the GRE. And in fact, almost every applicant now doesn't take the GRE, which is great. It's a, you know, it's great for, at least I believe that, but as you can see, the competency levels for the students that did not take um, the GRE is a little bit lower. Small amounts of data points. It's only been a few, a year, technically, they've been in the program. Most of our students are actually um, not full-time. They're part-time students that are working full-time jobs. So we'll kind of keep an eye on that data as we go through. But that's pretty neat, too. You can do demographics kind of associated to competency level. So how does it benefit, that's Dr. Cochran, who's the healthcare administration chair. He is a single um, instructor, can look at any of his students and you can do it in one course. So scaffold up the course in several different Canvas rubrics all the way through the one course. You can do it in the group. So that's our healthcare administration group. So um, Gordon Brewery, um, that's, that's our group um, that is, hopefully figuring out how to assess these, how to fix the things that we need to be fixed. And this could be an English 101 group cohort. This can be a ULO cohort. This can be any type of cohort can be that part, that group. It can be accrediting body. Cami loves this data. They're all about assessing and being able to see the assessments and progression of assessment. They love it. And, you know, most are Public health is all about accreditation. A bunch of accreditation um, is there. So Cami really liked the data. And the most important thing about the data that they liked is that it's student feedback. Students are still key. We were making sure the students are seeing these rubrics, are seeing that they have these competency levels. They see it throughout the entire program and they can constantly see it um, by interacting with them. And that's our one like push now is to make sure that they're seeing it in orientation and other ways to make sure that they can get that feedback and maybe reach out to their advisors if they're not doing so well on a, one of those competencies that they have. So lots of benefits. And again, it, I feel like it's very transferable to any 
you know, a single course, a, a program, a master course. Uh, I gave you, there's, I told you, I went through in like a minute about how to do Canvas outcomes and what I do, but there's a bunch kind of background into it. So I did little videos, little job aid videos, if you want to do the scan me, the little job aid videos, and then I have um, Google Drive links all over too. So little job aids all the way throughout there for all the information. And that's it. Any questions? So uh, what are the uh, the key challenges that you encounter? That's like the perfect question, Ramana, because it is the faculty. So um, there, it just takes a little extra steps to do this rubric. And we're trying to streamline it. That's what we're shifting now. So we actually just got approval to shift our competencies. Previous in the MHA, they wanted a separate competency. So they had a separate competency rubric. And so it was not part of the regular competency. They were all, I don't think they were getting to that rubric. So I was the one that was like, make, make sure you do your rubrics, make sure you do rubrics. So right now they all agreed, let's try to streamline it. We're doing it the EMHA way, which is the way I showed you in the way the ULO template is set up. Where when we're making it low stakes worth one point. So it's on the rubric as one point and we're making it low stakes on that. And then they should be able to click through it. So it should be a lot more seamless. So that was our big, and I didn't even show you how what we did it previously because that was our big take because we definitely had to alter some things. And competencies changing probably. So we need to make sure we kind of keep them for a few years, which I think we will. Any other questions? Yes. I think this is very, very useful because we are in engineering, we are going through a bad accreditation and we really depend upon um, of competencies in courses. So how easy would it be for faculty to implement in their courses? I think it's actually pretty, I mean, it's, you have to know a little bit about rubrics. So if you have like a background in rubrics, it's just one extra step as the background. So, and you probably need your EIT. So kind of plug for online ed. So somebody like Canvas admin to help with some more of the global stuff. But it's actually a pretty easy transition, especially if you're using Canvas rubrics. And I was gonna mention about skills. So I think this is actually translatable to skills-based assessments too. So you can do, um, for example, like kinesiology, they have, or nuclear medicine, they have specific skills that they have to attain. And you can do that as a competency and you can scaffold it upwards. So like one course might have a skill, one course might have an advanced skill, and you could kind of scaffold it upwards. And then the crediting bodies would see that. So skills-based, it's even good too as the competency outcome. So. Well, how much, um, uh, so what I hear you saying is that the faculty have to come to consensus around a rubric. Yes. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about how that process went? Sure. So the first thing we did in our faculty meeting, we talked about the mastery levels. So what mastery levels we want. That would be the top portion of any rubric. So we wanted only three. Actually worked out a little bit to the benefit of me because we only did three. So they only wanted three. And then what we had to do is um, take their rubric. And I just sat with them, Aaron Rosenberg, who's our amazing program. Um, director sat with them too and we just checked to see which competencies would actually fit the best and which one on her matrix would fit the best too so she had a matrix of course they all wanted to do um the can reading you see those competencies um can me actually gives us what they want to have in there we create them though so like it, there has to be a dei competency but we create the wording of it and that's the reason why it's shifted a little bit because they're not they're not given directly from the crediting body. That's a good question. Like on a scale of um, one to five, one being everybody was all in and consensus was super fast to five being, it was like pulling teeth. No, I actually feel like everybody was all in. They were really excited about it because of the, because they know that that's what the cutting body wants. It's a simple like step. 
we showed them, we did a small pilot the very first semester and then we're like, let's do it. So I think it's just because it had a secondary assessment or um, a rubric that it wasn't as seamless for them to remember to do that extra rubric. So it wasn't attached to their the rubric, which is what we're remedying. And then EMHA is just, just like I showed you where it has the competencies content is right next to the competencies all together in Canvas. Wasn't a lot of wordsmithing over these rubrics and competencies that happened? No, not at all, because we had the one attainment and we came up with that mastery levels and that's on the exact for all the way, all the way through it. So no wordsmithing at all. It was not that at all when it came to that. Any other questions? What's going on there? I don't think anything that. So thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, most of all, thanks to our panelists. You're absolutely fantastic. Thanks for sharing your practices. Um, everybody be sure and grab some water and some snacks as you go, and um, we will hope to see you all very soon. Thank you.